stream the webinar. The meeting is being live streamed. Awesome. Okay. Stream the webinar. <laughs> so now we are live streamed. Okay. Let's see here. Awesome. So Janet is so good to be here with you and to have this really important discussion. I just saw people will be coming into the webinar into the webinar room as we speak. So while everyone's coming on, I am uh, <laughs> Excited. I'm just excited to be here with you and to talk about this important topic. But just before we get started. So how are things in Mexico? <laughs> I, well, you know, it's funny, we were kind of chatting before we hit record. And I was flying through Dallas last week. And I said to Dr. Anna, you guys had some cold weather because when I was walking um, out of the airport, and it's funny, because I am Canadian, and traded in the snow for the sand. And now when I'm in Dallas, Texas, which normally would be all year round t-shirt weather for me, I'm like, it's a little, it's a little cold because I'm used to the tropics of, of Mexico. So we love it here. And um, for now it's our home base. How long have you been there? Uh, you know, it'll be two years in January that we moved. Awesome. Okay. So two years to get, well, I, I grew up in the Northeast and we'd have three, four or five feet of snow every winter and shoveling snow and all that good stuff. And I am very happy to be in Dallas. We have a couple cold months, but, and it can get in the freezing. We've certainly had some cold freezes over the last few years and the hail that was new to me. And we had even hail one day in August this year, which was crazy. So I want to welcome everyone as they're coming on to our webinar, Revitalize Your Pelvic Floor, Revitalize Your Pelvic Floor. We're going to be talking about all things regarding uh, pelvic health and definitely want to address some of your comments and questions as you come on. You can see that I just put a poll up. So just um, answer the poll and tell me where in the world you are visiting us from. So Jana, she said, is in Mexico, and I am here in Dallas, Texas. And I have some team members on. My daughter Amira is here in Dallas, and Jami is in uh, St. Simon's Island. So, it, you know, again, it, welcome from wherever you are. Just curious to see where you guys are coming in from. A second question on the poll is, uh, um, a question that Jana posed is what percent of women live with some sort of pelvic floor dysfunction? So you can type in an answer and um, just type in your answer on that one. I think you can. I can't see the, I can't see the answers coming in. And for orientation, if you guys coming in on the webinar, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or at the top, depending on where your menu bar is. And that's a place to type in a, um, a question. There's also a chat box. So if you guys are interested in all things pelvic floor, just say yes <laughs> or why and type in the chat. Let me see that you're here. Let's see here. All right. So, Jana, let's just talk about that. What percentage of women live with some sort of pelvic floor discussion? We're going to get into that. But as we do, for those of you, you know, I, want, I would love to introduce you, Jana, and have you introduce yourself to our, you know, to our viewers here. I know we have people from your community. We have people that are new from my community and people that are new to us both. So a wholehearted welcome to you guys. Well, thank you. And you know, Dr. Anna, before we get going, I just got a message from my support girl, Karina. And she says, Hey, Jana, I'm still waiting for this, the hostess. It says still says start the meeting when I came off of the link that was in the email. So I wonder if we maybe have a little tech hiccup, which sometimes happens. Um, 
So I, I just wanted to let your team know that there might be people in a room that cannot get to us. Yes, because we had over a thousand people sign up. So um, let's see, Jami, Amira, can you help us figure that out? And it says the chat is disabled. <laughs> we have some tech issues. <laughs> and you know what? That, that totally we happens. Have... So as long as the girls in the background can be doing their thing, we can totally keep the conversation going unless you want to focus on fixing the hiccup. Yeah. Yeah. We'll definitely do that and um, see what's. Hmm. All right. So hopefully our, our tech team is going to get that. And if you guys, you can't even answer me in the chat. So um, if you can answer in the Q&A box, those of you who are coming on, are you coming off uh, Dr. Anna Kabeca's email or Jana's email? And we'll figure, we'll figure this out. Yeah, of course we will. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and, and get started and we'll welcome everyone else in when they um, come in and we'll try to troubleshoot that. I know my team is going to be working on that. Hopefully we'll get this sorted out very soon. So um, Jami, again, there are people in a waiting room not being able to be let in or the meeting hasn't started yet. So there may be a link confusion. So an email may have to go out with a correct, um, a correction as soon as possible, possibly. So I'll have you guys, I'll have you guys work on that. <laughs> so okay, let's start. We'll go ahead and get started. And I see that we've got people from all over the country and some international with us, and I'm excited about that. Um, the first thing, again, is welcome to Revitalize Your Pelvic Floor. I am Dr. Anna Kabeca. I'm known as the Girlfriend Doctor. I'm a triple board certified gynecologist and obstetrician, also board certified in anti-aging and regenerative medicine and integrative medicine. And I have had my own hell, I've had my own trauma, physically, mentally, spiritually, all of that. And so when my doctor's bag was empty, I literally went around the world looking for answers. And from reversing uh, infertility and early menopause at age 39, to conquering the brain fog of perimenopause and mood swings and weight gain at age 48, to now being 57 with a 15 year old at home and uh, a granddaughter. So I'm thrilled to be here. Women's health is my passion and I really am here to empower you to be in charge of your health. And we're gonna give you some very helpful tools you can start using in your life right now and um, be able to answer, answer some questions too. So Jana, would you please uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, so hi everyone, my name is Jana Danielson. I originally from Canada, living in Mexico. I came into wellness entrepreneurship just because of my own pain journey. I was um, on track to do my business degree. I finished my MBA. I was the first in my family to, to do that and was you know set for the corporate world. And um, then I was gifted a pain journey. And my pain journey took me through two, three years of digestive pain and went through many doctors and specialists to be told at the end of that phase of my healing that the, the pain was in my head. I was seeking attention and um, was really just left to, I actually thought that that was what my life was going to be like. I was newly engaged my digestive pain turned into major pelvic floor pain. And those of you who live with pain know that you may start with pain in one part of your body, but eventually it's your whole being that is protecting and guarding and doing whatever it can to keep you out of the discomfort. And that's what happened with me. I saw Madonna on the cover of a fitness magazine when I was in the checkout stand at the grocery store one day, and there was this headline about this form of exercise called Pilates. I didn't even know how to pronounce it. I thought it was Pilots. And, um, you know, I went to my first class and literally 16 weeks after that first class, I was off all of my 11 different medications that I was on, didn't understand how my body healed, why my body healed and wanted to learn more. So that's when I became almost obsessed with learning about the body and how it can heal itself. 
became a master instructor in the world of Pilates and really started honing in on pelvic floor health in a, about 10 years ago when I heard a urogynecologist speak at a conference and he had just finished some research around pelvic floor health. And his research showed that in 90% of the cases of pelvic floor dysfunction, which we're going to talk about that, uh, that poll in a, in a, in a few minutes, but 90% of pelvic floor dysfunction actually is not a medical issue. It's rooted in movement, posture, fitness, lifestyle, and it really changed the whole conversation for me because I thought, okay, wait, if that's if that's the case and I can teach movement, I can then impact the lives of these women so that when they go to their pelvic floor physiotherapist or when they go to see their OBGYN, their, their body is different. They're, they're strong, they're functional, and they're empowered to live a life that is full of movement and mindset and motivation. And, and that's really what, um, you know, what I've been doing. I started a Pilates studio and that grew into a Pilates studio and an integrated health therapies clinic up in Canada, grew that to a team of 60 clinicians, instructors, and administrators sold that last year. And now I'm able to focus on my next chapter, which is the cooch ball, which we'll learn about a little bit later, my pelvic floor fitness tool for women to help bring blood flow to an area of the body that is often void of it and um, can really go a long way to changing the pelvic floor story in our lives. And I think that's really profound I mean, because you're learning to empower your body to help heal itself. Yeah. Which is what is which exactly what I love, which is exactly what I love. So it appears there was some confusion. So the reminder email took our participants to an incorrect link. The original registration email is correct. And our team is working on fixing that now. So hopefully we'll uh, get everyone, everyone else on in a second. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and end this poll and see what we got here as far as um, where people are from and looks like the majority are from the south and so 32 percent from southern usa 12 percent from northern usa 24 percent from western and 20 percent from eastern usa and we have 12 percent international so so that is awesome um Okay, share those results. And, huh, all right. <laughs> Look at that number two answer. We're gonna talk about that in, uh, in a bit. We'll see how close we are to that percentage. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. All right, so, um, what I want to go into right away, just a quick teaching of the pelvic floor. A couple of things that I also learned as a gynecologist and obstetrician is, you know, working on strengthening the pelvic floor. I always say, you know, clitoris to anus, the most important anatomy of our body. And that is so true. So the strength and keep that anatomy strong is important for structure, posture, you know, our, our back, our lower back and, and flexibility as we age and sexual health and bladder health, continence issues. And from urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, all of that is part of it. But certainly vaginal health is a big part. And there's a right way and a wrong way, wrong way to exercise the pelvic floor. And so Jan is going to teach you, teach you that too. And as a, a surgeon working with patients with incontinence issues, I started recognizing that I had to recondition the pelvic floor. So I would tell my clients to do pelvic floor exercises and the right way to do them and also using a hormone. So my Jolva cream, which has DHEA in it, I started using DHEA topically on my patients prior to surgery, not just post-operatively, but prior to surgery. And as I got better and better at it, patients would come back in for the preoperative appointment. So I'd start them on the uh, hormones one or two months earlier, and they'd come in for their pre-op and they'd be like, Dr. Anna, I'm not leaking urine anymore. Like this work, you know, and, and that's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. And, for, and certainly we see that 
all through. And so we kind of wanted to touch on pelvic floor anatomy. And, and uh, Jenny, you're probably going to want to go into more detail, but bring up my favorite um, <laughs> my favorite uh, demonstrator right here, the beautiful pelvis. And so when we look at pelvic floor anatomy, I think it's really, so top to bottom, starting with the clitoris, like a, right above the clitoris in this area, the soft, ab above the soft tissue of the clitoris is the pubic bone. And the pubic bone, if you can see here, there's a connective tissue or there's cartilage between this bone. So these bones aren't necessarily stuck together. They're designed to be flexible. And that's important. They can get stiffer with time. And in, in, in pregnancy, they can get very flexible where there's an, an relaxed and where there's even a separation of this pubic symphysis in pregnancy. And that can cause a lot of, a lot of pain and discomfort in pregnancy and postpartum. So that's um, uh, important to understand too, that our, you know, our bones are connected with cartilage and so it enables flexibility. And we don't want them stuck and stiff because that's gonna create pain, incontinence issues, and pelvic floor dysfunction as we age. So for clitoris, clitoris is actually, we see maybe a centimeter of it, if we're lucky, <laughs> or less, but it is uh, really, it's about eight to 10 centimeters long and extends along the uh, lateral wall. So kind of, you know, opens out over uh, within the labia and retracts and so and then above below the clitoris the first orifice that we get to the first hole is the urethra where we urinate from and that urethra just like uh, as we age we'll get some skin lines and wrinkles and laugh lines smile lines right so the urethra also will lose its connective tissue will um, lose its muscle strength and can lo lose its strength to close. And sometimes after sex or with sex or just in general, you're more susceptible to urinary tract infections. Um, certainly after sex, sometimes it's every time after sex and working on conditioning the urethral muscles is important. And then we have the vagina. So the vagina sits in between the, um, it's, it's got the, ovary sticking up here we go the vagina sits in between the um, bladder and the rectum so it's like a hollow tube so if we pull out the vagina the vagina goes to the uterus with the connecting point is the cervix and then we have our two our tubes and ovaries and so above the vagina is the bladder the bladder sits and below the vagina the rectum sits and so when there's relaxation between the anterior wall of the vagina and the posterior wall of the vagina, we sometimes say it's an anterior seal or a cysta seal or a recta seal. And so we want to look at those few things. Okay. And then the next is the anus. And the same thing, as we age, we can get anal fissures, hemorrhoids, because the loss of the connective tissue and the strength of that orifice, and that's a really important, because hemorrhoid, and I don't know if you've ever had a hemorrhoid, I have four big babies. So postpartum, I had some hemorrhoid. They're miserable. We don't want to talk about that. So I could just, oh, it just makes me cringe a little bit. I just did pelvic floor exercise right there, just thinking about it. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so I wanted to just kind of give that anatomy and structure lesson. And Jana, if you want to talk more about that. Sure. And so it's funny because I, I have mine within arm's reach as well. <laughs> and I also have an apple. And I want to tell you what the, the symbolism of this apple, because what Dr. Anna did so beautifully and clearly to go through the area um, of what I think is a part of our anatomy that we don't acknowledge like we should. I want to talk about um, the next layer and how the pelvic floor group of muscles actually is a part of your core. And I think that's one of the myths that a lot of people don't realize is when you hear, oh, I have to strengthen my core. Most of us will think, oh, I got to get on my mat and I got to start doing some crunches or some sit-ups because I need a strong core. And why I like to use my apple is because if I were to eat the kind of the meat or the fruit of the apple, I would have the apple core left, right? So just like an apple core, we have a core. The top of our core is a muscle called the diaphragm. So the muscle is our main, it's, it's the main breathing muscle we have. 
And because the body is so brilliant, over time as we become teenagers and young women and, and adult women, a lot of us will hold our breath or suck our belly in to make ourselves look, look smaller, feel smaller. And we actually shut down the ability for the diaphragm to do its job. Because the body's so brilliant, it says, oh, geez, that muscle's not available for breath. We better reassign the breathing function to a different set of muscles. Oh, who can take that job? And these little tiny muscles that are like strips of beef jerky in our neck called the scalenes and the sternocleidomastoids, they raise their hand. The funny thing is about these muscles, they already hold this big bowling ball on top of our spine. So they're busy, yet they say, we'll do that breathing job. So when you look at your apple, your diaphragm, the main muscle of respiration, it literally sits in the crest of the rib cage, all right? It's like an open umbrella or like a mushroom cap. The 360 degree circumference of the core is made up of four abdominal muscles. The one that so many of us chase for a lifetime because we were told it's a symbol of being fit is that damn six pack muscle, that rectus abdominis, which in, is, is the biggest joke because it's not a symbol of fitness. It's actually not. It's a symbol of a low enough percent body fat, which who knows if that's even healthy. And if our abdominal muscles were stocks and we were investing in stocks, I wouldn't invest in the six pack muscle because it doesn't have a whole lot of function compared to what our other muscles do. All right. So we've got that six pack muscle that lives right under the skin. Deeper to that, we have two sets of obliques, internal, external, internal from the right, connects with the external on the left and vice versa. We do a lane change going down the freeway. We th throw a ball to our dog. Someone calls our name. We twist. Um, that's what those obliques are helping with. Deeper to that is a set of abdominals called the transverse abdominis. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this group of muscles because they actually start in your low back and they wrap around the front of your body like a corset. These muscles are so important. They, they give our body shape, they support our spine, they support our organs, and they really do finish the entirety of the 360 degree cylinder of our core. So now we have the ceiling, which is our diaphragm, and we have the cylindrical walls, those four sets of abdominals, but what's the bottom of our core? It's our pelvic floor. And so that, you know, when you hear the word core now, I want you to think of it differently. It's not just a set of abs that we're working to strengthen, but it's this entire structure from the crest of the ribs down through what we're sitting on. And then the, the entirety of the rib cage and the muscles that truly is our core. And here's what, here's the next piece of this puzzle. When we stop breathing diaphragmatically, you lay a newborn baby down on a table on their back. What do you see? Their belly is rising and lowering with every single breath they take. That is the most purest form of diaphragmatic breathing. And then we become, you know, we, we're, we, we start to crawl. We start to pull ourselves up. We start to walk. We're now two legged. And then I said, we become, you know, young women and we have these beliefs and and expectations on what our body should look like and we start to suck in we the fashion we wear the shoes we wear it's all kind of perpetuating what can be pelvic floor dysfunction and do you i want to give everybody like high tens because that answer to the poll that you answered was a hundred percent correct 50 percent of women in the u.s are dealing with some sort of pelvic floor dysfunction one in two women, and we think we're alone, that is the furthest from the truth. 50%. So, 50%. And I'm, I'm talking about incontinence. I'm talking about generalized pelvic floor pain, pain during intercourse, constipation, bloating, some of those things that we don't attribute to pelvic floor. Ladies, we're not alone in this conversation that Dr. Anna and I are having tonight with you really has the potential to shift some of those beliefs. Did you know that the incontinence product industry is a $21 billion industry? Did you know that, Dr. Anna? Oh, my God. How much? $21 billion? $21 billion, billion with a B. And it's not it's not the solution. Like, it, it doesn't get to the root cause. But yet, we just, as women, I think we believe that 
okay, I chose to be a mom. So I should expect a little bit of peeing after that. Oh, I'm in perimenopause. Of course I should expect. And we just come to expect, but it does not have to be that way. You know, Dr. Anna, did you say 57? 57. Yes. Okay. I, my, my 50th is on Christmas Eve this year. And I just want to say that I, you know, looking at the two of us, I, first of all, age is just a number. And I would say hearing a bit of your story, I feel like I am way better now than I was 20 years ago. And, um, you know, if ladies, if we can just inspire and educate a little bit tonight to make you realize that, what you're feeling. If you're feeling stuck, if you're feeling frustrated or disconnected from your body, sometimes all it takes is a little bit of information. And when you turn something that resonates with you from information to education and start to live it, which we're going to give you some hints and tips, and then you start to share it with your friends, that information very quickly becomes wisdom. And I feel like the divine feminine is so wise. We've just forgotten. We've forgotten that. And we think we need to do it all on our own. And you really don't. I think that's, that's so true. You know, you are not alone in this and you are not broken and there's so much more that we can do to improve and to heal. And, um, and I think we'd start with like right now, while everyone, you know, we're, we're still, we had some technical difficulties or the people are coming on now. And again, I apologize for those of you, we're going to, you didn't miss anything and we're going to give you all the replay. So for sure, we're going to do that. But I want to just give you right now a, a exercise and, and Jana, do you want to go ahead and just like give a an exercise and even just starting with breathing, breathing, deep breathing and innervates the vagus nerve. And that's relaxing. That re- is relaxing. It will relax the sympathetic nervous system and stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. And it is, you know, it will reduce cortisol. So right now we could use a little bit of that right now. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm going to stand up so that you can see, because I like, as a Pilates instructor, I really like being hands-on. So the way I like to teach diaphragmatic breathing is there's this flat bone here called our sternum. All right. And then once so one hand on the sternum, one hand on the belly button. Why? Because we have this innate ability to feel. And I think we don't get our hands on our own bodies enough. And so if you imagine that there was a bullseye painted on your bottom hand and put against your belly button, as you inhale in through your nose, I want you to imagine breathing your belly button into that bullseye. So let's go together. Inhale, breathe into the bullseye. And on the exhale, gently melt that belly button away from your bullseye with an H-A exhale. Now rinse and repeat. Inhale, breathe into that bottom hand, into that belly button. And exhale. And I'm just going to turn to the side and I want you to actually watch. Okay. Let this go. Is it something we don't want to do? We're used to holding it in and squeezing it in and yes, hacking right? it in. Yes. We suck it in. We wear those waist trainers. Ladies, where do you think the contents of this part of our body, when we are restricted, stuff has to go up or stuff has to go down and we put unnecessary stress and tension either going up or going down. And so if we breathe this way in through our nose and out through our mouth, um, we're actually taking in 600% more oxygen in those breath cycles, which is going right to the cellular structure of who we are and giving us that little boost. And so in the afternoons, here's kind of a little hint. When you want to reach for that, maybe that cup of coffee or that sweet drink or something, you know, kind of 2, 2.30 and you're feeling a little bit tired, do some diaphragmatic breathing first because often what it is is the oxygen stores in the body are low and that kind of tiredness or that thought of, oh, I need a little pick-me-up to make it through the rest of my workday is actually you being in the state of oxygen deprivation. So taking some big, even better, get up, go for a little walk, fill your water bottle, go look outside, go outside for some big breaths, come back in. And then maybe, maybe half a cup of coffee is all you need, or maybe you don't need that sweet, um, you know, chocolate bar, you can go for something different. And so just understanding the cues of your body is, is really important. 
I love that. And and D asked, she said she had a physical therapist tell her last month that the best way to trim her waist was to hold it in. Interesting. Interesting. Well, here, okay, I'll tell you this. So that's, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that because again, so if, if I, if my torso was a soft bark tree, when I'm inhaling, I want the bark on 360 degrees to expand. And then when I exhale, I want it to contract, right? I want it to be like this great big accordion, but what I want to avoid is holding that tension, right? Think about, um, you know, you're driving in your vehicle and all of a sudden you're driving on a residential street and a, a basketball goes, you know, bouncing across the road. You slam on your brakes. You don't realize it, but you're probably doing a little bit of a butt squeeze, a pelvic floor lift, a scary movie, right? Anything that startles us, we have this innate response in our, in our pelvic floor. And you know what, ladies, that's also from an energetic perspective, it's your root chakra. It's your, it's your confidence. It's your safety. It's your security. And so what I would say D is there's always, I mean, a, a, for a muscle to be functional, it needs to know two, two things, when to work and when to rest. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you're trimming your waist, I believe that it's through good movement that has rest and work as a function of, you know, not even just an exercise, not a crunch on your mat, but, you know, when we're vacuuming the floor, are we paying attention to, you know, are we slumped pushing the vacuum back and forth or do we have purpose when we're shoveling snow or raking, you know, raking the, the lawn? There's lots of ways our activities of daily living can be exceptionally functional from, uh, from an abdominal perspective. And so I just want everyone to remember that is that anything too intense one way or the other, the body's always going to want to come back to some sort of equilibrium, right? And so, you know, keep, keep that in mind that, that yes, you know, holding will trim that waist, but I will say this tight muscles are not functional. And Dr. Anna, you can talk about that. I'm sure even when you think about a hypertonic pelvic floor, right. percent of women have hypertone yet most people will do a Kegel to create more and more and more tension. I think we should maybe touch on hypertone versus hypotone and, yes. and what the difference is. Yeah. And it's a, you know, I would say that um, when we look at pelvic floor dysfunction, like a good percentage, 10 to 15% is actually hypertonic versus hypotonic. So there's that, it's a small percentage, but it's still significant enough. And, and that's where you have pain. When So when a patient comes to me, I had a patient come to me last week and she had chronic pelvic floor pain. She had been seen, she'd had two bladder surgeries. She'd um, had a mesh erosion from one of the bladder surgeries and unable to have sex, was in significant pain and continuing to get vaginal infections. So I examined, like, you know, she's been, you know, seen by multiple specialists at some of the top universities. And so I examined her, and first of all, like, you right away, you know, needed hormone therapy, vaginal hormone therapy, because we add hormones to the vaginal floor can help muscle, collagen, connective tissue, and healing. This is beyond estrogen. So DHEA, and sometimes I'll add testosterone, sometimes I'll add progesterone. So adding that in. So that was the first thing. And that's why she was constantly getting erosions. That didn't happen with my patients because I put them on vaginal hormones or topical hormones um, like DHEA, Jolva, so that they had that good conditioning. So we're not going to get a mesh erosion or something like that. So, and then I examined her and I could feel her psoas muscles. I could feel the hypertonicity in her muscle. And so in a, when a gynecologist, you guys have had gynecology appointments, I'm going to use one or two fingers in the vagina and feel the laterally, the lower, um, uh, right lateral side of the posterior of the vagina and the left lateral side posterior of the vagina and feel for any muscle tenderness, any, you know, if there's any uh, break in fascia or evidence of laxity as well as evidence of hypertonicity. So a pelvic floor therapist will work with a woman in this case too as well. And you can through muscle tension or you know, muscle energy exercises, um, applying tension there, the muscle will relax and she was instantly out of pain, pain she'd been walking around with for 
months and months and months. And so wow. in, and then I showed her how to do it herself and she could do it also with a, um, a narrow vibrator using pressure in that area. There are well-designed uh, pelvic floor devices too that you can use to angle into one side or another and teach her husband how to do the same thing to relax those muscles and until we break that cycle of that hypertonicity. Jana, what would you add to that? Yeah. Like I, you know, I, I feel like the Kegel has been, you know, it, it, it's, well, we, I also like to say pelvic floor exercise because yeah. Kegel was some guy. And so I'm yeah, like, oh, pelvic guy. floor, right. pelvic, but that's what we're talking right. about when we say pelvic floor exercise. <laughs> exactly. And, and I think layering on that is this, again, we're busting myths tonight that, you know, most people are taught that specific pelvic floor exercise with the cues of stopping the flow of urine and then starting the flow of urine, right? Like that's at least that's how I was taught. That's, you know, through all of my, my teaching and owning my, my studio and my clinic, I would hear that story over and over again. And when you think about a muscle, so if I am going to lift up I'll just use this pin. This is a weight. If I'm going to lift this pelvic model, I'm moving through a range of motion. When we, when our pelvic floor is working, it's working through a range of motion, walking, jumping, even sitting, um, peeing, pooping, having sex, all those, those are all ranges of motion. We never train any other muscle in our body by squeezing it and letting it go and squeezing it and letting it go. And so as you learn that sometimes it's it's the um it's the letting go that's that's challenging and, and one thing i wanted to add dr anna before we move on is you know when you think about the breath work and i'm going to i'm going to do this i'm going to say this twice because for the first time it it might be counterintuitive to some people so when we're breathing in through our nose when we took that great big breath and and got our belly button to kind of melt or reach into our bottom hand, that bullseye hand, what's happening in our body is when we breathe in, our lungs are filling with air. So that diaphragm, that main muscle of respiration here in the rib cage, it's kind of like a, like, you know, a boxer kind of ducks out of the way. The diaphragm has to get out of the way. It's contracting. All right. When we take an inhale and the pelvic floor is going into a state of relaxation. So the pelvic floor and the diaphragm, remember I said, they're kind of like best friends. So that's why when we're not breathing with our diaphragm and this muscle, this big mushroom cap is not moving, the pelvic floor isn't responding as positively as it could be. So that's all on the inhale. When we exhale, the lungs empty with air, there's more space and the diaphragm gets to come back up into that dome shape and expand the pelvic floor follows it in that contracted state, all right? So there's this beautiful dance between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor. And so when you understand that the body, we're not potato head dolls, right? We don't like put on our strong arms to help a friend move or you know, put on our big red lips for date night. We are systems. And when one part of the system is a little bit off kilter, the other systems will function. But over time, they're going to start to get strained and not be as optimized. And so that's, I mean, that's earlier on when Dr. Anna talked about posture and we talked about breathing. You know what, gang? It's It sometimes is as simple as those fundamental things that we overlook because they seem too easy. Right, Dr. Anna? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Those basic, like even the deep breathing, right? I mean, even something like we know that's going to relax us, make us feel better and um, strengthen us in the long run. But just those little things, it's easy. A lot of it's, you know, it's doing less and not more sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it totally is. And I think that when we are, um, you know, from a postural perspective, our, the bones on our feet, we have 26 bones in each foot. And you don't have to be a mechanical engineer to look at the structure of the foot and see that we've got one great big bone at the back of the foot cal called the calcaneus, and then 25 other funny shaped little bones. Well, 
big bones are meant for stability, holding, bearing weight, little bones like in our hands and our spine and those in our feet, right? And the little bones in our pelvis or sorry, the big bones in our pelvis. And look how big they are. They're, they're holding us, right? Did you want to they're, say something? Yeah, they, they create, I mean, that is, they're, they're bearing the weight of us. They are our access of mobility and flexibility too. And then of course, lots are hammock of muscles of the pelvic floor in between these bones. I mean, that's what's holding, holding our pelvic floor up. Everything, you know, our uterus, the bladder, I told you the bladder sits on top of the vagina, the rectum's below the vagina and our intestines are in there. And it's got to have so much flexibility, strength, and mobility that, you know, thinking about the most, <laughs> I was like, most important muscles in our body. My audience always hears me say this, clitoris to anus, most important anatomy, pelvic floor, most important muscles. <laughs> so, and it's, and it's true for quality of life. And, and it is the number, you know, and, and to be, we had a question about incontinence and I'm, we're going to hit on that too. Want to finish this train of thought, but it's also incontinence is the number one reason caregivers put their loved one into a nursing home. And so, and I had four teenage daughters and they're looking for reasons to get rid of me and it's not going to be because of incontinence. That's for sure. <laughs> so, so we talked a little bit about, okay, we're going to talk more about the pelvic floor exercises. We talked about hypertonicity and now focusing on the right way to do pelvic floor exercises. And, and John is a Pilates, you know, Pilates expert and, and created something called the cooch ball that I want her to introduce to you tonight. And we'll talk about that as a useful tool and what other tools and props we can use. And also, you know, Jolva, if you guys aren't familiar with Jolva, I'll share more on that in a little bit, but conditioning the pelvic floor through using bioidentical hormones or DHEA and, and plant stem cells that's in Jolva can really help keep this tissue healthy. And so it's important that we focus on this and then doing the exercises in a, a right way, whether it's because it's hypotonic and we need to strengthen them, or if it's hypertonic and we need to relax them. And, and that's important to know, to know your own, well, what's happening with your body. How does it feel? How does it react? Does it relax? Are you able to contract and relax? And is, if there's pain, that's a whole nother issue. We always have to get to the core root of the pain. And I love that. I think oftentimes we're so focused on the symptoms, right? And if we can hone in on that root cause, sometimes many of the symptoms melt away. And so I love how you've kind of framed where the conversation has gone. I want to loop back to that posture piece because it really is, um, it's something that over time, when you see someone in their elder years and you can tell their posture, you know, they're a little bit hunched over, they might be shorter than they were five years ago. It really is. Or the other thing I hear a lot of is, you know, with osteoarthritis, well, my mom had it or my grandpa had it or my, so it's just runs in our family. And actually it's not hereditary. It's, it's a function of our posture. Think of any, if you're driving down an old farm road and you see an old building, you know, a dilapidated house, that's kind of leaning over that structure is compromised. It's, it's lost its foundation. Our body does the exact same thing. And our feet are actually the foundation of our house. We don't think about that. Right. And so optimizing our standing posture is really important for pelvic floor health. And here's how we do it. Most of us stand with about 80% of our weight, not, not even in the, we call them the, the metatarsals. So then the, the, the knuckles in the feet where the toes kind of connect into the, into the foot. Most of us stand with weight under the pads of our toes, about 80% of our weight forward, unbeknownst to us, it compromises our structure. And what happens to the pelvic floor is because we don't have this beautiful stacked skeleton, the pelvic floor is put in a compromised position because it's not bearing or being supported by these big, beautiful bones. These bones are where they don't belong. And now the musculature, the ligaments, the fascia, the nerves are being pulled along for the ride. The simple fix 60% of your weight back in that big heel bone, the calcaneus, 40% of your weight across those knuckles in your feet, those metatarsals, not under the pads of the toe. For the first little while, you might get a little bit of, you know, 
back discomfort or discomfort at the back of the knees. And actually why that's happening is because you're now loading the muscles correctly, right? And when you- Okay, so you got to paint that picture for me again. So heel and the, the, yeah, you can, okay. Can you show us? I'm going to, I'm going to show you. I love that. (laughs) My next thought was, did I, are my feet clean? And I am (laughs) ready here next week, but I'm going to show you. Okay. Let me. I love you. That's awesome. Thank you. Oh, I see my book menu pause on your desk. I love it. I I have all of my favorite Dr. Anna things here at my table. (laughs) Okay. So here I'm going to show you my foot. Okay. So can you guys see like, so right here, see how my toes where my toes connect into the main part of my foot, there are these little knuckles, okay? We wanna have 40% of the weight of our body across these metatarsals and 60% back here at the calcaneus. So it actually creates a tripod, right? Think about a photographer. Think about those of us that have our ring lights up, right? There's a tripod. A tripod is a sturdy position. Our feet have tripods. We just sometimes don't use that tripod and we get things like bunions on the side of the big toe or bunionettes on the baby toe. And that's all a function of these beautiful bone rhythms through our feet, right? We're supposed to go heel strike, baby toe, big toe. This is the rhythm of our foot, right? It's this beautiful almost dance. I'm sure you have people in your life who you can hear them coming down the hallway because they're going smash, smash, smash with their heels, right? And that is all, you guys, that's impacting your pelvic floor. So in standing, 60% of your weight in your heels. And if you're like, oh my gosh, I can't feel what's 60, 40, what's 50, 50, just as long as you're not 80% percent forward and 20 percent weight back you're going to start to change how your pelvic floor is responding to the weight distribution through your feet 60 on the heels 40 across those metatarsals those toe knuckles and you will be on your way to changing uh, the infrastructure of your body so you think it's better to walk around barefoot and feel the ground and do yeah i do A hundred percent, a hundred percent, because there's all these beautiful nerve endings at the bottom of our feet. That's why when, when little, when toddlers or babies are learning how to walk and then, I mean, I was guilty. I would buy the cute little Nikes because they looked so damn cute, but all of a sudden my, my, my confident toddler was all over the place because we've taken away the communication system. So if you can be in bare feet, I am a huge proponent of that. I also love me a good high heel shoe. So I'm not saying throw your shoes. I'm just saying, but even in a running shoe, right? We have a bit of a, of a, of a decline in our, just know that foot health is just as important as, you know, strong arms, a strong pelvic floor. It's, It's all function. And so much of the chain going up you know, foot issues can become plantar fasciitis, can become Achilles tendonitis, a lot of the knee stuff, hyperextension in the knee, hip bursitis, you know, gang, it can all really stem from the foundation of our house or this, think of it as the stage we perform on, we perform our life on a stage. Do you want your stage to be a bunch of rotten two by fours or do you want a glorious stage like, you know, at the Grand Ole Opry or somewhere on Broadway in New York. So that's the biggest, uh, the biggest thing to remember with standing posture. I I love it. So for our viewers, you know, did you guys think we were going to talk about feet and how it relates to the pelvic floor? I mean, but it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, like, who's going to talk about feet? I mean, I, Jana, Jana surprised me. So I, I love it because the foundations, what are our basics, what are our core, what are our foundation? That's what we have to get to, to rebuild and to improve our structure and function. <laughs> and and I, I love that because that's the unexpected. And this is something I learned from Dr. Uh, Neil Galloway, a Euro, urologist at Emory University. And he was just an amazing, amazing clinician. And, and, you know, he said, you know, look at some, if you're worried about someone's incontinence and bladder function, if they're having any bladder issues, look at their feet and ask them to spread their toes. So you guys can do that right now. Look at your toes, spread your toes. Can you spread them? All right, good. We have our foot model coming 
So how are you doing there? Let's see how you're doing. Okay. I'm okay. and I, I'm giggling because I'm gonna show you my good foot. I shouldn't okay. say that we shouldn't label, but I do so, and this is why, ladies, when I had my three boys, I was a left hip boy mom. They sat here when I was swinging hockey bags it was over my left. I'm right handed, but I can tell you all for much of my life, this was my, this was me. And my, my left foot is not as I'm not able to spread it as much as my right. Isn't that crazy? Okay. Okay. So that's your right. Look at how that's a great spread. That's okay. a great you spread. Look, you see these two toes? Do you see these two? Yeah. To together yeah this foot look at that yeah so a significant big difference and so so then that's that's one thing and then from you know as an osteopathic physician you know we think of the sacral nerves as two three and four which innervate the pelvic floor inner the pudendal nerve innervate the pudendal nerve also innervate the feet as two, three, and four are responsible for mechanical action of the feet. So especially the big toe movement. So if there is a problem in the, in the sacrum, S234, nerve impingement, um, structural issue, a, you know, you know yeah, it can be uh, many things. The, you know, whether it's structural or from the nerves, you're going to have a difficult time spreading open those toes. And it is like anything else. It's an exercise that has to be done. I mean, I, I just work on it and, and I never noticed that one foot was really different than the other, but now I'm noticing that my left foot is better than my right foot. I wonder really what that means. Hmm. I need to get an adjustment, number one. <laughs> But also yeah. to exercise, you know, exercising your feet and picking up things with your toes and and doing those dynamics to keep those nerves innervated at the very, very tips. And it does feed back as well. So I think that's that's an important exercise. So you guys, the pelvic floor begins with your feet. <laughs> begins with your feet. And you know what? When you go for a pedicure and they put those little foamy things between your feet, take a cue from that. Like if you can put each finger between each toe, you are well on your way to pelvic floor health. I have a friend of mine. <laughs> she loves wine. And so she keeps wine corks and she puts her wine corks between her toes to work her pelvic, <laughs> to work her pelvic. Yeah. So anyways, you know, There's it's a thought. things, right? Like you don't need a bunch of, a bunch of fancy equipment. You literally can put your fingers between each toe rev it up like a motorbike, ring them out. It doesn't feel great. And they might, your feet might cramp. And that's part of improving your foot function. Uh, I, I love it. I love it. Okay. So let's work our way up now to the pelvic floor mm -hmm. and talk about the very important the strengthening of the pelvic floor and, and how you came to create the cooch ball, what we can do with or without one. And there's some great comments here in the chat box. So I'm going to say, you know, Casey said, super helpful. Thanks. Um, Angela, happy to be here. And, uh, uh, Mary Jade said, shoes don't seem to support that, like that whole foundation heel with more weight. There are some, I use zero shoes, X-E-R-O to work out in sometimes. And so those are, you know, those are more designed with that negative gravity towards the heel. And otherwise though, but you know, Georgia for 26 years now in Texas, I'm pretty much barefoot in sandals a lot. But when I have to wear shoes, I wear, you know, whatever I want because I'm mostly barefoot. But um, so, I mean, you definitely can weigh in on that. And um, MJ said, you guys are a great team. All women should hear this. And you guys, we are giving you the replay. So you will have that. You didn't miss anything. We're going to make sure you get everything to be able to listen to this again and do some exercises. So make a note for yourselves, too that your feet represent the foundation to overall physical health, but certainly pelvic floor health. And toe exercises, add that to your habit stacking so you can do some fun toe exercises. And really, if you go for a pedicure, really freak out the pedicurist by like spreading your toes really wide. I mean, can do that. And it's a challenge and it's something you have to, sometimes I do it regularly and I can get more strength and flexibility and other times I can't. But definitely if you're having incontinence issues I want you to focus on that. Um, 
And uh, let's see. Um, thought on toe separators, like like you were saying, the cork in between your toes or something like that. Um, what else? Oh, here. So Amira said, so wine is again um, where the oh wait, wine is again useful for our health. Ha ha. Now the cork, Amira, the cork, not the wine. All right. <laughs> and I, okay, I love that. And let's talk about incontinence. A um, uh, client asked here that, okay, you've been using Jolva for two months and really, and is it for incontinence? What are the health issues that you're having? But uh, I'll talk about, uh, John, I'll talk about this, then we'll go into pelvic floor. Yeah, so Jolva, Jolva is my um, cream, my cosmetic cream for the vulva that I created when I was, I retired my clinical practice and patients in 2014 and, or 2013, 2014. And my patients would say, Dr. Anna, no one will give us your creams, potions, and lotions that we love that was really helping us. I mean, because compounding is an art and many doctors just aren't trained in it yet. So they don't offer it. So I was, I made a commitment to myself and to my patients that I was going to come up with something even better that you didn't need a prescription for. And with years and having been working and customizing hormones since 1999 and, um, and having at, at one point also having a, a, a cosmetic line, I created, I created Jolva with DHEA and plant stem cells from the Alpine Rose. So DHEA is good for resilience. It's one, it's, it's produced by the adrenal glands and the ovaries and menopause cause mainly the adrenal glands and in both men and women and it starts to decline in our mid to late 20s it helps with it helps with muscle it helps with connective tissue it helps with bone it is the higher the healthier the higher it is typically is higher resilience better immune system so there's a lot of benefits outside the pelvic floor for dhea but it's been studied now for over 20 years on vaginal health and pelvic floor so that and someone had asked the difference between estrogen and jolva so estrogen Estrogen creams and gels work only on the mucosal layer. That's the first layer of the vaginal wall. Like say, for example, the inside of your mouth is comparable to the inside of your vagina. So it's only working on those mucous membranes. DHEA and testosterone and progesterone work on all three layers, the connective tissue, the muscle layer, it can help revitalize that tissue. So what happens when you're using a Jolva regularly, you get your body's natural moisture production. Again, it basically turns back the hands of time. So it increases rugation, helps with your pelvic floor exercises to give you more muscle strength and is um, helps with incontinence, you know, vaginal dryness, orgasm, and clitoris to anus, because people forget about the clitoris, first of all, and that will atrophy and even can get scar tissue if it's not conditioned as well. So we got to pay attention to that too. And it's often, and it shrinks as we get older, unless we're adding back some hormone, doing exercises, having good blood flow, having good sex, all of those things help stimulation. And then also I tell clients clitoris to anus because the anal tissue can get fissures, hemorrhoids, and this can help with that too. The plant stem cells from the Alpine Rose are, I chose those because this is a flower that has been well known for its cosmetic properties and reducing fine lines and wrinkles, right? If we're having them here, we're having them down there. And so it reduces those fine lines and wrinkles, helps strengthen the collagen, the connective tissue, and it's antiviral as well. It has some antiviral properties. So that's important for the pelvic floor. We want to make sure that, you know, we don't have viruses, bugs, et cetera. So we want to keep it um, as healthy as possible. The difference with estrogen, again, too, and so DHEA is perfectly fine for men. I have men that use this cream. Caution, we had a, uh, one of our, our doctors at clinic use the full trial pack. You know, it's a seven-day trial pack, but he's like, I'm a guy, I can use a lot more DHEA. He's a doctor, right? He knows it all. And so he used the whole seven-day trial pack of Jolva. 
And he said, four hours later, I thought I was going to have to go to the ER because I still had an erection. I was really beginning to worry and I just had to laugh. So um, good for the guys too. It's, um, it's, that's, that's like the, on the down low. Uh, we don't want them using all our Jolva. <laughs> so so um, estrogen gets onto your male partner and it's likely they don't need any more estrogen. <laughs> They're making more as they get older. They probably don't need, need any more. So estrogen is, is transmitted uh, bad, you know, if you have using vaginal estrogens and gels, that's going to get on your male partner. And that, you know, or you have to really time and add one more timing thing to your intimacy schedule, and that can be a challenge. You can definitely use vaginal estrogen as well um, as, as Jolva. The caution is always, I tell my patients, just if you're, if you typically have sex at night, then use your estrogen cream during the day. And often then there's a discharge because it's so much gel. And that's why I created Jolva to be really concentrated. But DHEA converts to estrogen and testosterone a little bit at the cellular level, not intrinsic. That's why uh, many oncologists use this and recommend this in their breast cancer patients even, and their oncology patients even. So very very safe because it's topical oral dhea can convert to more testosterone and give you acne we don't get that same we don't see the same experience now i typically have you start using this every other day for a week to two weeks when you haven't been using anything and then increase to daily and sometimes you need to use more and maybe massage it into the vaginal area to get um, very atrophic tissue healthier. So sometimes you can you can do it that way too. I have clients put it on a vibrator and insert it into their vaginal canal also, and that can really help. So this is this is where I I learned to you know I created this because I was compounding creams to help clients condition them for surgery. So I'd have good vaginal tissue to operate on. And the better, like the better and better I got, and the longer they used it, typically just two months, six, one month to two months, they often came back with their incontinence gone, their complaints were gone. And so that's, I mean, it's really, that's what this is. It's a part of a good pelvic floor regimen, whether if it's for sexual health, vaginal moisture, incontinence issues. So that's that piece. And I teamed up with Jana because of the pelvic floor strengthening and the concept of, you know, it's not just, it's never just a cream, a potion, a pill or whatever. We have to empower our body and that's the beauty of the feminine body is that no matter, you know, what we're dealing with, we can improve, we can improve and imp in strengthening the collateral muscles. So um, I'm gonna let you take it from here because I'll go on and on and on, you guys know me. Well, no, that sounds great. And so while I'm doing my shtick, why don't you take a look? There were lots of questions in there. And okay. We can look back around and make sure everybody gets their questions answered about Jolva before we before we say goodnight. And so I'm going to take the baton from um, Dr. Anna. And so the cooch ball was something that was born. I, I have three boys. They're 18, 20, and 22. And this feels like my fourth baby in in, in some way in that when I was working with my clients at my studio and working as part of an integrated team at my clinic, it got really frustrating for me when we would get to this kind of conversation. And so many women would either, you know, their eyes would look down, they, you know, they would acknowledge the down there versus like, you know, the, the words that we should be using. And and I started teaching these pelvic floor webinars. Uh, no, not webinars. Good Lord. The word webinar didn't even exist then. They were seminars. <laughs> Do you guys remember the day of seminars when you would actually go to a place for, for learning? And um, these seminars would, would sell out. And at the end, no, or no one would ask me questions, but at the end, women would be in a lineup in tears waiting to talk to me because I had just you know spoken to them and they learned things they they never really realized. And so as I was working in my studio and, and improving pelvic floor health with postural improvements, with breathing, there was a, a that that third leg in the tripod was just not, it wasn't, it wasn't there yet. And so just through all of my understanding of the body and kinesiology and healing, inflammation, knowing that oxygen-rich, nutrient-rich blood 
is the way our body heals. And like 2000 years ago, if there was an injury, you healed or you didn't. Right. And so my, my challenge was how do I get this blood flow to the pelvic floor outside of what my pelvic floor physiotherapists were doing? Right. And then I thought, what if I could create something that all those clients that were seeing my pelvic floor physiotherapists, what if that therapist had a new pelvic floor to work on every six weeks or every three months? And it wasn't the same, you know, lack of tone or too tight muscle that they kept seeing over and over and over. Cause in between sessions, women weren't quite sure what to do. And that's what really inspired me. And so of course the, my boys were much younger then I, I knew that, you know, people would use a tennis ball to release knots in their shoulders. We know that massage and acupuncture bring blood flow and healing. And I thought, what if I could find something that you could sit on in a fitness class at home, at the office, when you're on vacation. And I went down to their toy box and I sat on every single mini basketball, floor hockey ball, like you name it. And it was like the three bears. Some were too soft, some were way too hard, but I couldn't find a just right. So that's what I created. I created this little ball and seemingly it looks like a ball you could go to a department store and buy. But what you can't see is what's the layer of just, I think is brilliance in between the bladder of the ball. And there's no pun intended, but the bladder of the ball and the outer covering. So the rubberized bladder around it has this really cool nylon thread that's wrapped in a very, um, purposeful pattern. And then when you blow the ball up, it's not totally inflated because we've mentioned already the, the, the parasympathetic nervous system and how, when you're breathing deeply, the parasympathetic nervous system gets this big hug. We nurture it. Well, the other side to that equation is the fight, the flight, fight, freeze, the sympathetic part of the nervous system. Right. And it's not like it's unsafe to sit on a cooch ball that's rock hard. It's just not as impactful or effective because the alarm bells in your body can start going off. Like, what is this? This hurts. I don't know what this is. Let's protect her. So when you fill your ball and there's a little bit of squish, the simplicity to this ladies is you work your way up to a three minute experience sitting on your ball on a chair, on the floor, on your mattress, and you breathe diaphragmatically. Your breath is your guide, essentially. There is something called the ouch factor, and the ouch factor is an inverse relationship to the health of the blood flow around the pelvic floor. So the more your pelvic floor mus musculature, the tendons, the ligaments, the fascia is like a desert, the ouch factor is probably going to be elevated. And so for some of my women, they'll start with 10 seconds, and then they're done. And then they work up to 15 and then they work up to 30. And as the ouch factor decreases, you know, with confidence, the biofeedback your body is giving you is that your desert is turning into this beautiful flourishing oasis of healthy blood flow so that those nerves like the pudendal nerve, so that the neural network in the body can rewire those roadways, right? The pudendal nerve is sensory, which means pleasure through pain and it's motor, which means all the messaging goes down that one main highway. And we need the environment. It's like a plant. Plants do not flourish without sunlight and water. Our muscles, any muscle, it needs, it needs blood flow. And that's why hydration is so key. And, and that's as simple as the cooch ball is. And that's why, you know, it was so great to partner with Dr. Anna on this because they're, they're two very unique, but such complementary ways, right? To come at pelvic floor health and give women back their confidence, their sensuality, and um, just their ability to be in their body and love their body and be humbled by their body instead of disappointed by their body. That's, that's, that's very different. So that in a nutshell, and I should say, when you turn it 180 degrees, it's also co-branded for the guys in our life as the gooch ball, because men also have pelvic floors and a lot of incon or erectile dysfunction, um, incontinence, post-prostate cancer, even like my boys are two of them. I have two college athletes in my, in my family and they have their balls in their college dorm rooms and they use them because 
these muscles get tight, just like our neck and shoulders and glutes get tight. These pelvic floor muscles get tight. So that's, that's the cooch ball. So, I mean, it's brilliant. And uh, there are some questions like, that have come in and we'll address those too. It's a partnership. It's, it's pelvic floor exercises. It's relaxation of the pelvic floor exercises and it's conditioning of the pelvic floor. So I always tell my clients, you know, from when I would see them, usually when I, like I would announce, uh, announce their pregnancy, I'm like pelvic floor exercise, you have to do it now till you die. But again, there's the exception when it's hypertonic, you've got to relax it. So Jana, can you clarify? So hypotonic or hypertonic, and if you do want to strengthen those so issues with incontinence, pelvic floor exercises done right, strengthening and adding in Jolvin, sometimes I need to add additional testosterone, but also depends on the reason for the incontinence. Stress urinary incontinence is, is sometimes from a breakdown of the... Um, of the the fascia and so we have to sometimes surgically sometimes it's there's nothing i can do hormonally that we need to go on surgically but that's very rare i have to tell you that's very rare when we get when we get it right so let's talk about hypertonic hypotonic pelvic floor exercises using cooch ball and my team is going to put some uh, links in for you guys so jana has a special offer for the cooch ball i have a special offer for jolva actually my lip duo um, so my Jolva Kiss and Jolva Pro and sexual CPR course. So because there's a lot more to sexual health and intimacy, knowing your anatomy, knowing your triggers, knowing your turn on and erogenous zone, understanding the medical reasons. So I have that for you guys too. And I'll tell you more about it later. I know there's a bunch of questions here and I'm, we're staying on to answer them. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you, Jan. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, <laughs> I knew you were yeah, 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 no. So if you think of a, a, a number line, okay, a continuum, one to 10, and, and don't, the numbers don't mean anything, but on one end of the spectrum, there's hypertone, too much tone. You give your kids sugar or after Halloween, they were hyper too much, right? The muscles are too tight. On the other end of the spectrum, there's hypo, H-Y-P-O, lacking tone, all right? And, and there's all the little parts on the number line in the middle of those two. It just doesn't mean you're one or the other uh, at all. And you can ebb and flow. I was at, um, I went to see my, I'll tell a little story. I went to see my pelvic floor physiotherapist and I had a bad cold when I, when I went to see her and she did her internal exam and she's like, Hey, <laughs> you have a grade one prolapse. And I was like, shut the door. How does the cooch ball girl have, have a prolapse? And she's right, like, no, right. you know what? we know what it's it obviously was from all the coughing and sneezing and, you know, intra-abdominal pressure that was, and, and she's like, no problem. So there were, I had a trigger point right on one side of my pelvic floor. So she did the, the manual release. And I just worked through using my cooch ball, doing my breathing, the extra exercises that she gave me. And when I went back six weeks later, I was, I was back to, you know, to the, the prolapse was healed. And so I want you to understand that, you know, it's not just one or the other and a prolapse does not mean you're on this, you know, slippery slope to, to end up getting surgery. That that's not, that's not the case. And so how the ball works for either of those situations is this. Yeah. And I want to add in incontinence because you have it doesn't mean you can't reverse it. I had significant, I remember being like late thirties, early forties after, you know, my, my children and doing a P90X workout and completely wetting myself in the work. I'm 57. That doesn't happen anymore. I mean, that yeah. doesn't happen. So like, this is, you know, and it's so important. As I mentioned early on, the number one reason that caregivers put their loved one into nursing homes is because of incontinence issues. And so, so the relaxation of the pelvic floor, the prolapse, the, you know, in the urethra. So we can do something about it is what I'm telling you often without surgery. Yeah. So, and you know, it's, you know, can the cooch ball turn back the hands of time and take a grade four prolapse or, you know, where th there is a pelvic organ already outside of the body? Yeah. Obviously not, right? Yeah. We cannot do that. But there's ways that we can work post and even pre-surgery. Pre. 
right? Because you want to strengthen the muscles pre-surgery so they have good tissue to operate on. I mean, or you run risk, you know, the terrible post-operative risk. So doing it pre-operatively and if it and if it heals it makes, you know, livable, that's great. And if not, you need surgery, but you're at a better place to have surgery. So that's part of the conditioning using the vaginal hormones or using the the exercises done right and that makes it, you know, I mean, it does make a big difference. So I always say like, that, like till we die, y'all just have, I made my point. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and you're right. And so if you're, if you have a, a too tight pelvic floor, there's a lot of tension or you're, you're someone who has had trauma in through the pelvic floor in, in different, in different ways. When you sit on the cooch ball, remember what I said earlier, tight does not equal strong. So just because you have too much tone doesn't mean you're uber strong. It just means those muscles are tight. You're still probably going to cough or sneeze and wet a little bit. It doesn't mean you've got this brick wall of protection from a little bit of, of, of peeing, a little bit of incontinence. It doesn't mean that at all. So when you sit on the ball and there is that hypertone state, you're probably going to need to either take a little bear, bit of air out, sit on your couch with a big comfy cushion or on your bed to take a little bit of the brunt of the ball away from the body when you first start. Men and women that use the cooch ball when they have hypertone, if you think of the pelvic floor like an elevator, their biggest challenge, they can get to the penthouse in two seconds. They just have a really hard time getting back to the lobby. They might end at the fifth floor and they, and they think that they're at the lobby, right? So it's, it's not so much the, can I lift? It's how effectively can I lower back to a state of rest? So, so that's why the breath work. And when you get the cooch ball, you get the cooch confident training system. It's really important that you understand that even before your ball arrives, the more you can do with your breath to feel the lifting and the lowering. And, and you know what gang, honestly, sometimes it takes weeks and sometimes it takes months. Like Rome was not built in a day here. And so reconnecting and re-engaging with our body is, 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 is kind of the first step. And that can be frustrating. So what we want to start to do with hypertone is take our time. The ouch factor will start to decrease. You'll start to feel the lift and lower. When you get off the ball, there will be this beautiful tingly warm sensation. That's blood flow. That's how you can feel the changes being impacted. And then, like I said, with the breath, we start to learn on the exhale or on the inhale phase of breath is when the, the elevator is coming back to the lobby. And on the exhale phase of breath is when it's going back up to the penthouse. So understanding that, and we need to start to, we need to start that relaxation phase. We need to remind the muscle that it has a rest phase and a work phase. On the other end of the spectrum is that hypotone, lacking tone. That elevator is going to be damn hard to get to the third, fourth floor, but oh man, it can slam back down to the lobby. No problem. Right? So it really is when someone with hypertone or hypotone is sitting on the ball, if you were watching them, it looks the same. It's just, where is the focus? Where is the intention? And for those that have too much tone, the intention is the inhale as the melting of the pelvic floor makes its way back down to the ball. And for those who have hypotone or lacking tone, the intention and the focus is on the exhale and the lifting phase of the breath and then controlling the lower so that elevator doesn't slam back down. So that's really the difference between the two situations of hyper versus hypo. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And, um, you know, appreciate that clarification. And so we got some questions in and I wanna go through those. Um, and I know there, uh, Mychella has raised her hand. Mychella, do you want to uh, unmute and uh, chat with us? See if you can unmute. Um, hey there, how are you? Hi. Hi, welcome. Thank you. What question do you have for us? Um, I had a question about using your cream after having a breast cancer diagnosis. 
So that's a long discussion. I always say talk with your, you know, talk with your oncologist because your specific situation can be very unique. And whether you're on tamoxifen um, and whether we know the etiology of it, it's usually, I mean, we have to, we have to go there. So have we used it in breast cancer patients? Have breast cancer patients used it as, you know, on their own? Absolutely. And I had a patient today I was consulted on from Wisconsin and she had breast cancer 10 years ago and she's 74 years old and she's been really struggling with all the pelvic floor issues and vibrancy as well as um, osteopenia and uh, um, almost osteoporosis diagnosis. And so the question whether her position, it was a physician, a physician consult with her on the line and so the question is, well, you know, for me, I asked her, well, what caused the breast cancer to begin with? And so, I mean, I can give a whole hour lecture on this, if not longer, but, you know, what caused it to begin with and do we know? And, you know, and it, it may have been the annual mammograms up through age 64, like almost 20 years of annual mammograms could have caused it. Uh, possibly it could have been dental uh, issues she had from root canals and amalgams that were in her mouth. That could have been a cause. Otherwise, she had no, uh, you know, no, uh, living a good, healthy life, you know, uh, living the life, so to speak. So, and very health conscious. But those were the two things that I could say, huh, well, those are a little suspicious. And then we did a toxology report on her and she had very high plastics and DDT from pesticides. So there are many areas in, in farming communities that they spray a bunch. A wine country is another area that sprays a bunch. And so only organic wine. Some of my friends now say, well, never drink California wine again. I mean, I'll get some backlash on that, but you really have to pay attention to what's on the grapes, et cetera. So, so there, there are many reasons. And if you're on tamoxifen, oral DHEA is contraindicated, but again, with your gynecologist permission or your oncologist permission, topical DHEA is good. And I have a good article on my website on DHEA and breast cancer. Does that help? All right. Yep. Yeah, it sure does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you for being brave and raising your hand and, and asking a question. I love it. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are there any other hands raised? I don't see any, but we have a bunch of questions in here. And so we'll answer a couple more questions. And if there, and uh, we put the links to the offers. So there's the offer for Jana's Cooch Ball. Will you just talk about that? Because you've given it over like half off. Yeah. yeah. So let me, so what, what, what I'm offering tonight with a little bonus is the Cooch Ball and it comes with it comes with the pumps. So you, you're all ready to go. And then a little get started guide. And then you get the Cooch Confident Training System. And tonight, um, for this audience, I've also added something called the Cooch Fix Pack Mini. And the Cooch Fix Pack Mini is three additional movement sessions with me. Uh, they're about 30 minutes each. And what we do is I get to show you how to use your Cooch Ball literally from head, head to toe wellness. So one of those sessions is using your cooch ball for upper body wellness. So we do a really great breast health uh, section with the cooch ball. We do a little bit of release through the back of the neck. Um, we do a little bit of work in through the low back using the cooch ball. And then the second movement session is all lower body. So we work on some sciatic health. We work on the calf. I love um, Miranda Esmond White, who is a a movement expert from Canada talks about the calf as being the secondary heart muscle because that blood has to pump back up against gravity through the calf muscles back up to the heart. And so we do a little sequence on the calves. I do a little sequence on the feet. And then my most favorite one in that sequence or in that series is the gut health piece where we take our cooch ball and we actually do a psoas release, which is really important. And then we go through the ascending, the transverse and the descending colon using our cooch ball. So it's great for constipation, for bloating. And that whole, that three-part series is a bonus for you tonight with this, um, with this cooch ball offer. That is awesome. You know, Jana and I partnered because, well, we know each other and love each other. So that's one piece too, but Jolva and Cooch Ball make a really good companion. And so because of this, you know, this topic and the importance of the pelvic floor, and I say sexual health is necessary for optimal health and that whole part of empowerment. So what I've done, what our team has done too, we've offered the Jolva Lip Duo. 
So it's Jolva uh, Kiss and the Jolva, the small Jolva tube. So the same side, the 30 day tube of Jolva. So that's my lip duo plus my uh, five week program called Sexual CPR. And all of that is for, I think, $97. There, we'll put the links in here. And this is only available for two days. And I really do want to offer you guys and encourage you guys to go ahead and take advantage of this. And Sexual CPR, it's a program I initially launched and did live at 497 so now it's virtual but you do also get for you guys two months into my girlfriend doctor club where like this i'm able to well, actually able to see your faces in my girlfriend doctor club so through a zoom uh, zoom webinar i actually can see your faces and you can ask questions you know and troubleshoot and it's a really really created and cultivated a very lovely and um, empowering community of women and so so that's something special for you guys and it's the uh, Jelva lip duo and just a quickie this one is an ointment I created it for you know the skin lines in my lips because you know that's a um, uh, you know, pet peeve having lipstick bleeds. So I'm not use, uh, you know, I don't have them anymore. And that's why I created Jelva because I was using regular Jelva on my lips. And I will tell my girlfriends and my girlfriend doctor community and they'd say, Dr. Anna, I can't use the Jelva down there up here. I'm like, yes, you can. You can use it on your neck too. I mean, it's, it's great. But, uh, I created also the ointment. So this is the other secret to the kiss. If you have irritation or like, for example, af like after sex, sometimes it can be, more tender skin and you can use Jolva Kiss. You can also use it for hemorrhoids and and um, if you have fissures and because it's more of an ointment. So but designed for here, absolutely safe down there. Both are. So the interchangeability of Jolva multi-purpose, anyway, super fun. Um, I have that for you with my five week sexual CPR program that people are always, always grateful to have that information and that context and then join me live in the girlfriend doctor club. So we've got that and cooch ball and Jolva. I mean, together it's a good combination because it's never, like I said, you know, the understanding your pelvic floor, improving your posture, strengthening your core, it that is key to good sexual health and optimal health and pelvic health and these incontinence issues. Because sometimes it can be, we need that extra, we need that extra strengthening or depending on what the cause of, of the incontinence is or the pelvic floor dysfunction. So Casey has a, had asked, how do you know if you're hypertonic or hypotonic? You know what, Casey, the best um, way to have confidence with that is to find a pelvic floor physical therapist who can do an internal exam because, you know, I think sometimes we think, oh, I'm running to the bath, you know, ur there's urgent, let's use urgent continence as an example. So you got your bags of groceries, you're walking up your steps, you know, you're punching in your code to your house. And the moment you push unlock, you didn't have to pee a nanosecond ago and you're dropping the bags un, you know, you know, unbuttoning your pants and making a beeline for the bathroom. Generally. Yeah. Right. I was so tonight after my coffee <laughs> <laughs> and it happens. Oh my gosh. This summer following my boys on the golf course, let me tell you, when those bathrooms are only about every six holes on a golf course, you got to be very strategic. But, um, what I was going to say is it, it, when that happens, you might assume, oh, I've got a weak pelvic floor, right? Because we, that's the way we, it just makes sense, right? My pelvic floor is weak. I can't, I can't hold, you know, my bladder gets full or whatever is going on. And, but in some cases, you know, I have had women that have talked to me about that exact same situation and they go to pelvic floor physiotherapy and they're like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm like hypertonic. I'm like, I'm like bricks on the inside of, of my, of my pelvis. And so I just think pelvic floor physical therapy is such a unique niche, um, way of, of getting those answers is I would, um, that's where I would start. Uh, I, I, I love that. Dr. Anna, can we talk, there was one question we missed about, um, rectocele. I know you touched on this, but I would love to hear you again, just go through and define that for us. And then I just want to just add a chime in a little bit with the cooch ball and, and a few clients that have had rectoceles and use the cooch ball. 
Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about how the um, vagina sits within the pelvis, so you have the bladder anteriorly in the front, close close to the pubic bone, somewhere here. And then, um, so under the pubic bone, you have the bladder. And above the vagina, the bladder sits in that space between the pubic bone and the vagina. So if there's a relaxation of the bladder into the vagina, that's called a cystocele or anterior um, uh, prolapse. And so below the vagina it sits the rectum. So the rectum sits below the vagina. And of course, the opening to the rectum is the anus. The vagina sits on top. And when there's a break in the fascia, typically a loss of musculature, a break in the fascia can be a tear on the sides or midline um, in the fascia. So essentially, just like as if you tore a muscle, um, that can create a a prolapse into the vaginal wall can be from exercise, childbirth, riding, cycling, the many reasons that can be caused. But also, as you get older, that tissue thins out, it becomes weaker, and, and, and that can leave it more susceptible to injury. So with the rectocele, when we have that, we first want to, you know, like I'll examine a patient you know, vaginally and see, okay, well, first I always ask, is it worse towards the end of the day versus the beginning of the day? And, um, and pay attention to that. Is there constipation? Do you sometimes have to insert fingers into the vagina and put downward pressure to eliminate stool? And that often is because of this, now this, instead of a nice tube, it's like um, ballooned, but so strengthening the strengthening the pelvic floor, conditioning. We can do what we can with DHEA or Jolvo or adding in prescription testosterone. But if there's a tear in there and we can't strengthen the collateral, the surrounding muscles enough, then we may need to do surgery. So, but also again, reduce the strain. So how are you exercising? Are you like, what types of exercising are you doing? Putting pressure on the pelvic floor. If you're constipated, we want that dark black, you know, dark brown banana type stool, not round, hard stool. So we also focus on the mechanics of your bowel movement and improve the gut and improve the um, motility of the gastrointestinal tract so that you're having regular healthy bowel movements and not adding that strain. So there's a few things we can do to make it asymptomatic and and, and ho hopefully really more often than not avoid surgery. That's my, that's my GYN side, Jana. So tell me. So good. Yeah. And I mean, it's, you know, the, the pelvic floor, I think sometimes people forget about the back end and how the pelvic floor relates to the anus and the rectum. And it is literally, it's, 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 it's an, it's its own little ecosystem, this whole beautiful cauldron known as our pelvis and our pelvic floor. And, um, so when you, I mean, if, even if you did it right now, like as you're sitting, listening to us, if you took an inhale through your nose and re think about relaxing, the elevator is going down to the lobby. And on the exhale, there's this beautiful lift and then inhale, let the elevator go back down. That is very different than, and we've all done this. So I'm going to use this example and I've used it before. We've all been in line at the grocery store or at the bank and we have gas and we just do not want to fart. And we're like holding everything in. Like we're, we're squeezing our butt. We're squeezing our vagina. We're doing everything. Our stomach starts to hurt, right? Because we're holding this gas in. That's what we don't want to happen when you're on the cooch ball. We don't want it to be this big, dramatic, let it go and then clench it all in. That's not it at all. And so I've had great success, of course, working with my clients along with their pelvic floor physiotherapists, because I don't, that's, that's beyond my scope. I don't go inside the body at all. So when I can work with someone who's working with a physiotherapist who can, it's this beautiful trifecta because now the client gets to feel the warm, tingly blood flow coming into action in their pelvic floor. The therapist is like, oh my gosh, it's like I get to work on a new body because, you know, she's understanding or he's understanding because there is pelvic floor physiotherapy for guys as well, um, accessed anally, right? And um, so that's been my experience with, you know, the rectocele and the cystocele 
diagnoses that when you can support it with good movement, it moves you in the right direction as far as the healing process. I love that. Yeah. And I think like that learning to work with your breath and not against it. And so that is, you know, that's really powerful because oftentimes we we're straining and especially when we're using the restroom, we're straining and that's going to create, you know, I mean, that can create uh, prolat then weaken the muscles, weaken the connective tissue, um, sometimes tear it. So strengthening the collateral muscles, keeping really good, strong core, which is good for everything, and um, paying, a, you know, just paying, a, being kind to yourself, paying attention to yourself. So I think those are good. Those are good things. All right, Elizabeth asked if um, if you have fibroids but no bleeding, size of a five month pregnancy, should I have elective hysterectomy almost at menopause and hoping they'll shrink? I thought surgery would help pelvic floor, but now after research, I feel removal of uterus will hurt more than help. In other words, bladder prolapse, ligament, laxity, etc. So there's so much, Elizabeth. A couple a few weeks ago, I had a client come in, she's 50 and she has a 20 week size. Um, so like a five, you know, like a, basically a five month pregnancy, a 20 week size uterus. And she was she is trying to avoid hysterectomy as well. And sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. She has trouble with constipation because it's so much pressure on the on the colon and the rectum. And while we're working on mobilization, I'm also watching is it stable? Is it shrinking with what we're doing? Or is it growing? And that just makes me concerned. And if we do need to operate, you know, we you can ask for a supra cervical hysterectomy, and that can keep more of the structures in place for um, avoiding that avoiding that prolapse. And so, you know, a, you know, an, a small abdominal with a a, a, hysteric, a five month size uterus, I would do a I would do an abdominal hysterectomy versus a vaginal hysterectomy just to avoid any further trauma to the vaginal floor. So I can do it through a, you know, a reasonably small incision. And, um, but it really depends. Is it growing? Is it not growing? Is there heavy bleeding? What's going on? And if everything we're doing is not making progress or shrinking, or you have other issues, then, um, then, uh, you know, maybe worth doing a super cervical hysterectomy if there's no history of abnormal pap smears. And I mean, it's a long discussion. So definitely, you know, get two, three opinions from gynecologists that are well, you know, that have great reputations in your area. And especially someone that has a functional medicine training can be beneficial too. So, all right. So, um, Pam said, oh, wow, I have an incontinence, rectocele, lichen sclerosis, my perineum tears every time I have sex. I take a compound with 1% estrogen and clobetazole twice a week. Perineum still te tears. Will this cream help? It's a good next right step. We have, um, there's a lichen sclerosis comment board, and we always get people in there. I was here, my, one of my friends runs the board, and she'll be like, Dr. Anna, there's another one saying that Jilba's helped her lichen sclerosis, which is so powerful. But lichen sclerosis, again, like the, look at it from multiple ways. Is there anything that's been constantly contacting the skin, chlorine bleach that we wash our clothes in, um, pads or tampons that have ta toxins in them, is there yeast infection, is the gut healthy? So we were, I work on those things with patients and then use Jolva. I typically start with my with clients who have lichen sclerosis on the healthy area outside of that region because that skin is very, lichen sclerosis is a paper thin skin, it looks like cigarette paper. And so I start using Jolva on the outer areas every other day and then gradually go to every day and then uh, work and massage it into the area of light and sclerosis. So I will start on the healthiest skin first and then move inward in that case so you don't get irritation. Um, and and that can help. It's a good next right step. And and hopefully with a good gut regimen, like for example, my keto green hormone detox in my book, The Hormone Fix, that can really help you with, and yes, that's a, and supplementing with keto green shake. There you go. Oh my gosh, she's amazing. And that, I mean, that can be very beneficial. We want to heal the gut, heal the GI tract, 
And um, also in menu pause, the keto green extreme, you can start with that plan too. <laughs> so, so those are a couple things that I think can help. Okay. Um, uh, would Jelva help during prostate cancer treatment? In it's DHEA is not um, prohibited in prostate cancer at all, um, but you definitely want to make sure they're not converting a lot of testosterone to estrogen. So something to talk about with your um, doc, uh, your their doctor, but. Um, DHEA at the intrinsic cellular level has been shown to be very safe, but I would run it by absolutely his, the medical provider. Sam said, I have a prolapse bladder stage three, getting close to stage four. Is it possible to improve the pelvic floor, raise the bladder, and avoid surgery with dedicated pelvic floor exercises? Jana, what do you say? You're you're not going to not help it. That's what I, that's kind of the way I, I, I mean, not working one-on-one -on -one or kind of knowing how the progression has gone. You know, can I say with a hundred percent confidence, I can't say a hundred percent confident, but what I can say with a hundred percent confidence is when you start to implement the breathing, the posture, the blood flow, you know, using Jova, those, th those are all very positive um, you know, inspired actions to take to start to improve where you are. And I mean, you heard Dr. Anna say, you know, she would get patients, you know, with surgery scheduled and coming to her saying, I don't think I need my surgery. So it is, it is, it is possible. Awesome. Yep. I, and I, and I agree. Absolutely. Again, and you're, you know, it's not going to hurt for sure. And it can definitely help and hopefully prevent. Um, I, you know, when I, I always use the combination of hormones and pelvic floor strengthening, um, doing these exercises, I didn't have the cooch ball then. I imagine I would have avoided more surgeries, but I would, between the functional medicine approach I take towards hormone balance, where I used to do as a gynecologist two to three surgeries a week, I went to needing to do two to three a year. So just keep that in mind. It really can make a huge difference when we do these integrative these integrative, these integrative aspects. And again, like I have shoulder, you know, frozen shoulder issues. So I've been working on that, but like I have to strengthen the collateral muscles in order to improve the shoulders. And you know, Dr. Anna, you made me think of something that we didn't touch on. And I, I think it's important is that you've gang, you've heard Dr. Anna talk about these, you know, she's used the term collateral muscles more than once tonight. And I just want to mention that the pelvic floor does not work on its own. It is not like a one, you know, a one trick pony. There are three other muscles that are what we call the core recruiters of the pelvic floor. And we we've already talked about some of them tonight. So those transverse abdominals, the deepest set of abdominals, which, which work when you are breathing diaphragmatically, those are core recruiters. And that's why the breath is so important. The adductor muscles, which are essentially your inner thigh muscles. So if you just put your hands on the inside seam of your pants, run them up from the inside of the knee up to the groin, those are your adductors, all right? The adductors are co-recruiters or supporters of the pelvic floor. Then the glute muscles we have, they're like the three bears. There's the glute min, the glute med, and the glute max. The glute med, which basically comes off the angle of the tailbone and wraps around to the outside of that big long leg bone in our leg called the femur. The glute med is also a part of the co-recruiter group. So anything you're doing with movement, even you know, laying on the floor and doing a few leg lifts and lowers, or, you know, how I, I also use my cooch ball when I'm on zoom calls and I'll just put it in between my knees. It'll help with my alignment, hip, knee, ankle, and I'll just do just little subtle squeezes for my inner thighs. So understanding that these bigger muscle groups are also required to function well so that that whole structure can be optimized is, is important to mention. Yes. Yeah. No, I love that. I'm glad you mentioned that and elaborated on that. And a question about, okay, th that we got asked a couple times, when to inhale and exhale with ah. the pelvic floor? Okay. So let's, we'll do this again. So when you are inhaling, 
in through your nose, the elevator is melting back down to the lobby. And that's why this is counterintuitive because most people think inhale, everything should be lifting, right? And at that point, that, that's, not, that's not the case. So you, when you inhale in through your nose, your lungs fill with air, the diaphragm muscle has to duck, and the pelvic floor is always going to follow the diaphragm. So as the diaphragm melts down, when you inhale, because the lungs are filling with air like big balloons, the pelvic floor is also going to slightly descend. When you exhale, the lungs empty. The diaphragm gets to float back up inside the rib cage. The, the pelvic floor is going to follow it. So when you are going to lift, you know, again, heavy bags of groceries, or you're picking up a box of books, or you're at the gym lifting weights, whenever you are doing that lifting, you want to support your body by making that exertion, the exhale, the pelvic floor is supporting, um, is, is being supported by the exhale. It's supporting the, the transverse abs or supporting the spine and the organs. Most injuries will happen at the gym or, you know, I just reached down to pick up my purse and my back went out. Well, it's because we didn't have the proper breathing to support the muscles in that activity of daily living. So I hope that helps. Again, the inhale, the elevator is melting downward. And on the exhale, the elevator is just lifting, floating. I love it. I want to just share your offer too with everyone. So, um, so this is the link. It's Dr. What is it? Is it dranna.com forward slash coochball? I think, right? I think that's what it is. Yep. Yeah. We'll put that link in the chat box again. And you guys have hung out. We've been here for an hour and 43 minutes and I'm very grateful for all of you. I know we had technical difficulties and I, and I apologize for that. We will send out the replay and our offers are good till end of day Friday. So I think so, right? My team yep. will tell me if I'm wrong, but at the end of day Friday, these are the special offers that you guys can get. And I just encourage you to go ahead and, and take a look at these offers. And if you're interested, get it. And you know, with us, it's, you know, we do a money back guarantee. So, um, so here is the Cooch Ball and Fix Pack mini bundle that uh, Jan is offering to you guys. And it includes all of these things. So you want to uh, run through it one more time? Yeah, you get your cooch ball, you get your pump, so you can start it right off the get-go. You get a welcome, a little postcard. And then, of course, you'll get a welcome email with the credentials so you can log in to your student dashboard because you're going to be getting the Cooch Confident Training System. And what I forgot to mention is there's also a course that you're going to get as a bonus called Gooch Power. So for the men in your lives who want a That's little awesome. bit of or, um, you know, just a little bit of education. Gooch Power is on that dashboard as well. And then, of course, you're getting your fixed pack mini with those three movement sessions on how to optimize your experience with me and the Cooch Ball. I love it. I love it. All right. And then for us at the Girlfriend Doctor, you get the at dranna.com forward slash revitalize for revitalize your pelvic floor. You get the sexual CPR program, which is has been 97 in its digital form format. That's been our lowest price. So you get it for uh, almost $40 off and the Jolva Lip Duo, which is normally $69, get it? <laughs> Favorite number. Anyway, $69. And um, so you get that for the combination of the two for under $100. That was really important for me to do for you guys. So the code's already applied. And then you just have to check out. And again, I, I do offer you 100% money back guaranteed. And what's not mentioned here, two months into the Girlfriend Actor Club, which is in essentially a $97 a month club. So I encourage you guys to take advantage and, and participate and um, and just see what's the one next right step. I, I guarantee you it is, you know, it, you are worth it. You are worth it and you will see results. And I, I love this combination. I had so much fun tonight, Jenna. Thank you so much for being here. Really delightful. I always learn something when I'm talking to you. You guys, when I got the cooch ball first, I was like, okay, you know, I know Jen, I'm going to call her. You got to talk me through it. I'm so glad you have those videos and you're like, oh, here's the videos, but here, let me, 
walk you through it. And I was like, oh, it was good. But then my dog wanted the ball and I had to fight with the dog. And no, <laughs> but it's, it's, it, you know, it, it, first it was like, you know, it's, it's, it was unfamiliar. So it was uncomfortable. But the more you get used to, so guys, you know, you're going to feel like, okay, this is a little awkward. It's a little uncomfortable. Don't put as much air in it initially to start. And then you can work yourself up to harder, but don't start. I'm going to go as hard as I can. That was what I did. And I let the air out and then it felt more comfortable and I got stronger and stronger. So I encourage you guys. I mean, that's an important combination because it's never just one thing and doing these different, you know, coming at our health from different perspectives um, is, is really important. I want I want you all to know that I'm grateful that you are here. I'm grateful for all of you and for my team and Jana's team also who have stayed late for us tonight. I know it's late in our, uh, we have some East Coasters and it is really late for you guys. And I, I honor you and I, I definitely, um, I look forward to having more of these conversations. So definitely let us know how you like it. I'm grateful. And Jana, any uh, final words? Yeah, I mean, Dr. Anna, thank you so much for, you know, letting me be a part of this tonight. It really like, you know, fangirl all the way. And now to share the <laughs> Zoom stage with you has been amazing. And and for, you know, for the for the ladies and the gentlemen that are here, I, I always like to leave with some sort of little parting, um, you know, maybe, maybe a bit of motivation or inspiration. And I just want to remind you that before we can have momentum, we're always so like, I'm on the wagon, I'm off the wagon, there's no wagon. And before you can have momentum, you need to have a moment. And then you need to have another moment and another moment. And when you start stacking these moments of drinking your water, using your Jolva, getting on your cooch ball, noticing your 60, 40, these are moments that are going to lead to lifestyle enhancements that are going to serve you literally for the rest of your life and watch how the people around you start to notice and you become this beam of light in their life as well, because you will fundamentally change from the inside out. So you could have spent your time tonight or today, wherever you're calling in from so many different ways and you chose us and that feels pretty good. So thank you for being here. Uh, thank you. And again, thank you to everyone. Thank you to our teams and God bless you till next time. Bye-bye. Good night. Y'all were amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay. And uh, I'm trying to log, uh, stop the recording. Jami. Why are y'all the most stunning women ever? Oh, you're so cute. Let's